what I'd like to do today, which I hope won't be frustrating to some of you, is turn directly to neoclassical economics and then turn to Marxist economics. The reason being that neoclassical economics, as the title, as the name might indicate, has some close connections to classical economics, as classical political economy, as classically developed by Adam Smith. And I think that the way it operates and the kind of issues that arise in it are worth discussing directly following our look at the kind of issues that arise when the economy is thought of in the way in which Adam Smith goes about construing it. Now, this type of economic theory, which has tended to dominate the field of economics, academically and otherwise, since the late 19th century, shares certain things in common with the classical political economy, while on the other hand, diverging quite significantly from it. What it shares, in a way, is, in a sense, the general acceptance that the unrestricted workings of the market in a situation where competition operates as perfectly as possible will be one that will, in a way, promote the welfare as optimally as possible of the participants in society, the participants in the economy. So consequently, neoclassical economics, like the economics of Adam Smith, will suggest that the economy, as a market system, should be left as free as possible. And that, in a sense, if any kind of extra market activity is going to be called for, it is only in those circumstances where the market fails on its own terms to do what it otherwise will do, which is optimally achieve the welfare of all. So on the one hand, there's a notion that the market is such that it is not predominantly a system in which interests become calcified into opposing groups, but that rather it somehow works out as a system in which individuals pursuing self-selected interests of their own, private interests, nonetheless enter into relationships that allow all of them to benefit in general, at least in the long term. On the other hand, this means that market relations have a kind of primacy, in that they are regarded as, in a sense, the centerpiece to the achievement of, in a sense, the welfare, the good, as it's conceived in these terms, of individuals. And that, therefore, if there's any call for any kind of non-political association, in particular political association, it's going to be as something that will be a kind of subsidiary instrument to enabling the market to achieve, in a sense, the maximization of welfare in those cases where the market, for one reason or another, is incapable of doing that on its own workings. Now, despite these similarities, there are obviously great differences. As Levine pointed out, if you think about the classical political economy that Adam Smith presents us, it really takes as its point of departure an idea of a social division of labor that is inextricably wedded to the circulation of commodities. That is, to put it 
Smith's terms, the extension of the market and the division of labor and the differentiated way in which the production of commodities operates are intimately bound with one another. And in this respect, the very reproduction of this system, of this intertwined system of production and consumption, in a sense dictates that prices be such as to enable this interconnection of the division of labor and the circulation of commodities to operate. So that in a certain respect, the kind of needs and the kind of revenues that are required by the participants in the market are in many respects determined by their position in the network of these operations. And their position becomes differentiated in terms of types of economic functioning which get associated by Smith as well as by Ricardo with divisions into classes. Classes of wage laborers, classes of landlords, classes of owners of capital who have specific needs on the basis of their role in the economy. Now by contrast, the neoclassical position is based on a theory that Levine in effect identified earlier on as one that characterizes what could be spoken of as economics as being a way of acting, a way of acting in a very abstractly non-contextualized way where we're really just simply speaking about what could be called, well, rational choice, the exercise of rational choice, which is something that will operate whenever individuals are acting with ends of their own and are seeking to realize those as best they can in face of given circumstances, in face of given resources, which in that respect, insofar as they're given, could be said to have definite limits, could be said to have what could be called a kind of scarcity. And as Levine characterizes, it's a situation where what is at stake is really thought of in terms of allocation. That is how the given resources are to be employed, used to satisfy given needs as opposed to thinking of any kind of dynamic system that is going to be concerned with generating a growth of economic activity, a growth of wealth that will have something to say about, in a sense, the very engendering of needs that do not heretofore exist, needs for both items that get to be produced for consumption as well as items that are required to engage in expanded reproduction, expanded manufacturing, and so forth and so on. Here instead, what is simply thinking of a situation that, in a sense, can be defined in terms of a single individual, a single agent, whose action could be regarded as an instrumental activity, an activity that is concerned with choosing what resources to employ in order to satisfy given needs. And these needs are determined by the individual. They're determined by the individual self. You could say that they're determined psychologically. And in a way, it's up to the individual to determine which of their desires is more important to them. And equally, it's up to the individual to decide what will amount to the maximization of their desire satisfaction in general. That is, the individual will, in a way, be the one and only, let's say, arbiter to determine what their welfare consists in, because their welfare would consist in the satisfaction of the ends or desires that they happen to have, that they themselves estimate to be of interest to themselves, and 
if there's any kind of way of engaging in a calculation of how best to achieve their interests and to promote their welfare in general, it's up to them in a way to think of how to well, make their different ends commensurate so that it's possible in a way to calculate what would be the best way of, in a sense, achieving their greatest happiness, their greatest desire, satisfaction. Now, if you think about rational choice simply in this very um, technical sense, this very psychologically determined sense, where individuals confront given resources, they have their own purposes that are defined by themselves, and they are concerned with making those choices that will most efficiently make use of the resources to satisfy their ends as best as possible. You can obviously see that this way of thinking about what might be called economizing behavior could be thought of as having a completely general application. Right? It could be applied to any field of action where one is acting on purpose, which is to say one has an end, and one is concerned with figuring out what to do to achieve it. So in a certain sense, this could be regarded as a, a type of behavior that is just built into, built into purpose and activity, built into conduct in general. But even though this way of thinking can be thought of as of universal application, it is employed as a way of making sense of how the market economy operates or how the disengaged economy operates, whereby it's recognized the fundamental situation that defines the market is basically the exchange relationship thought of in terms of contract. Now, if you think of the fundamental economic relation in terms of contract, remember we, we you may remember how um, Lani um, spoke of Payne, who wanted to speak about what distinguishes modern societies from traditional societies in terms of the con distinction between a society organized along contract versus one you know, organized around status. Well, here in a certain respect, we have a way of theorizing, thinking about the economy that on the one hand is going to employ this notion of rational choice to a specific context which is going to be thought of as being a contractual situation. And if you're having a contractual situation, we're talking about a situation where we have individuals who relate to one another as owners, as independent owners, who as independent owners are entitled to dispose of what they own as they see fit. So if economic association is to be thought of as operating in terms of contractual relations of property owners who are going to use their property now in this relationship in terms of rational choice. That is to achieve as much desire satisfaction as they, they can. That is to achieve their ends. So after all, you can speak of desire satisfaction in a very general sense where if you have a purpose, you desire to achieve it. If you have a purpose, you want to achieve it. You want to find the means to achieve it. And whatever purposes you have, you want to achieve as many of them as you can. Well, if you're now in a framework where the means for achieving your purposes are by means of entering into contractual relations where you're going to be exchanging property, property that could consist of alienable commodities, it could consist of your labor power, it could consist of money, whatever. Well, you're in a situation where if individuals who partake in contractual relations are going to be relating to one another solely in terms of rational choice, then they will reach an agreement only when it is, I could say, to the benefit of both of them, both the parties. Or in other words, the transaction will, we could say, uh, increase their welfare or increase their degree of desire satisfaction. 
because neither party is going to agree to enter into a contractual relation, the exchange relationship, out of compulsion. This is a voluntary exercise of rational choice. So every instance of the exchange of goods in the market would be one in which both parties could be said to benefit. And when we say benefit, what measures that they benefit? What is the standard? It's their own subjective standard in the sense of what? What is the, in a way, the criteria, the criteria that each party, in a sense, appeals to? The end they're trying to meet? Yeah, which in general could be spoken of what? As it might apply to any such interaction, no matter what the items are that end up being exchanged. It's personal welfare. Well, you could say personal welfare. If one used by welfare, simply, basically, satisfying one's desire or maximizing one's desire satisfaction. Because you're going to give up something that obviously you have chosen not to covet as much as what you're going to be obtaining. Right. If you're acting according to rational choice. And that means that every single economic transaction will be of the form where the parties involved will benefit on their own terms. On their own terms. Now, in a certain sense, that depiction of exchange relationship, you know, has a certain plausibility because we are indeed speaking about voluntary relationships. Relationships that individuals enter. Where they indeed do choose to, in a sense, exchange something for something that they have chosen that they would rather have. Now, of course, you might ask, is that all that can be said about the exchange relationship? Is that all that can be said about what determines it from an economic point of view? Because it may well be that every single exchange relationship in the marketplace has this very basic character of being a voluntary transaction. That therefore individuals, in a sense, have chosen to obtain something in exchange for something else. Where they obviously, you know, could be said to be preferring what they're obtaining over what they're giving up. At least from the point of view of this transaction. But one wants to ask whether there is nothing else about the economic situation that enters into determining what occurs. Now, if one thinks of it solely in terms of this relationship, then the terms of the exchange are based on nothing more than the personal preferences of the individuals involved. And if one wants to speak about the exchange as occurring in terms of monetary exchange, then we are saying, in effect, that we think of prices as being minimally determined in terms of these individual psychological estimations made by the parties to the exchange. This seems kind of utopian. What about cases of fraud or coercion? Something like that. Well, I mean, one thing about this whole situation, and Levine points it out, is that it operates upon the assumption that individuals already recognize one another as property owners. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in a position to engage in this kind of mutual exchange. You'd have people unilaterally grabbing what others have, for example. Or disputing with them what it is that they own or what is theirs. So in order for this kind of interaction to occur, it presupposes a different kind of relationship, which is not itself the product of economic relations. They're not the product of exchange, but in a sense, had to be instituted otherwise. One could speak of it as something external to the operations of the market. And it's a kind of externality on which these kind of relationships depend. They can't operate without it. Which obviously raises questions about, well, what is it that provides for those relationships? And of course, it also raises another question that doesn't quite come into this very formal 
way of thinking about the situation. And that has to do with what is it that the owners have to exchange? Because the situation presupposes both that they are recognized as owners and that they have a given array of property. And indeed, if you think of the situation of rational choice as operating within a situation of commodity exchange, what, in effect, are the resources that individuals have to choose among? Or another way of putting it, where does scarcity reside? It resides in the commodity ownerships of others. What is the property that is available on the market? So in a certain sense, that indicates that the maximal situation, or let's put it this way, the best situation for being able to most fully realize one's desires is going to be one on the one hand, which will have, you could say, the greatest extent of the market, the most varied and diverse and plentiful array of commodity ownerships with which one can exchange, which might also facilitate the possibility of there being others who are willing to exchange with you what you have, or it might seem to facilitate the ease with which one can succeed in entering into a mutually beneficial exchange relationship. Any exchange relationship could be considered to be of mutual benefit. But you can also see that, in a way, the degrees of that benefit are, to some degree, dependent upon the options that one faces. Options that have to do, on the one hand, with what's available in the market. Options that depend equally upon what you have to offer the market. But anyway, the presumption of the neoclassical approach is that all of these relationships are to be thought of as, in a sense, being regulated by price determinations that are ultimately going to be dependent upon the individual preferences of the parties to exchange. And the presumption that a market that is as wide and open as possible will make it most easy for individuals to successfully enter into these mutually beneficial relations. And in that respect, the basic thought is that the unregulated market system, the market system that operates in as, let's say, perfectly a free way as possible, with the maximal options for its participants, will be one that will allow for the most beneficial mutual agreements. And these will be regarded as equivalent to, in a sense, the optimal realization of the welfare of the individuals of society. Now, of course, here, welfare is being defined solely in terms of what individuals individually determine to be what they desire or what they prefer. And all of this, of course, is operating in a framework where individuals are not relating to one another as encumbered by any other kinds of associations or relationships. We're talking about a situation where this is the only form in which they interact with one another. Now, the framework that this presents is one that, you know, as you can see, on the one hand, presupposes property entitlements. And it also presupposes the securing of those property entitlements. So in that respect, one could say that the neoclassical approach to the view of the economy in these very basic minimal terms, which could be said to obviously apply 
but, but you know, the question is, are they the only, is it the only relationship or the only determinant of the relationship in question that, that is at stake? But anyway, given this situation of individual property owners relating to one another in contractual relations, employing rational choice, trying to maximize their welfare where their welfare is understood in terms of their personal preferences, and finding a way of entering into mutually beneficial relationships where individuals exchange property, rearrange property allocations that will optimally satisfy the desires of the members of the marketplace. Well, clearly this presents one, one, let's say, task for what might be considered political economy in the mere sense of, in this framework, what task the state has in order to serve the conception of welfare that is operative in the market. On the one hand, the state must uphold property relations. And when we say uphold property relations, we're not talking about redistributing property. We're not talking about engaging in any kind of activity that would involve equalizing property ownerships. Because doing that could be regarded as violating property entitlements if they'd be thought of simply in terms of the right of an individual to dispose over what is recognized to be theirs. Any redistribution that would be done by public authority rather than through contractual agreements would be a violation of property right. So in a sense, the only thing that would fall in line with this kind of exercise of economic relations would be an administration of justice that protects personal property without concerning itself in any way with redistributing property for any other concerns. Now, on the other hand, there is another aspect for public authority. And that has to do with what generally could be considered to be market failure. In this sense that if the market operates in such a way that it does not achieve the efficient allocation of goods in line with personal preferences of the members of the market, then you could say that there's a need for some kind of extra market intervention for no other end than to achieve the ends that arise in the market, the ends that are pursued within the market. And the forms of market failure that operate, and again, I think it's interesting to think about what these are and what they signify, have to do in a sense with, well, one could say two basic features of, in a sense, the predicament that individuals find themselves in, in the economy. And one might say that this would be predicaments they find themselves in, in any situation where they are operating simply in terms of rational choice and interacting with others in terms of a mutual exercise of rational choice. And the first has to do with what are called externalities within neoclassical economic theory, and the other are public goods. Now, externalities have to do with, in a sense, the effects that contractual relations, or more specifically in economic terms, the exchanges in the economy, in the market, that individuals partake of, have an effect not just on the parties involved. In other words, the transactions that take place have effects on others who are not at all involved. 
And the effects could, you know, and here we're talking about effects within the framework of rational choice theory and, and this way of thinking about welfare in terms of the satisfaction or lack of satisfaction of, of personal preferences. The relationships between individuals, that always in a certain sense, to the extent that they take the form of commodity exchange, involve an achievement of a certain kind of mutual benefit, can also at the same time have an impact upon the welfare of others who are not involved in the transaction. And if that's the case, then the operations of the market are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Because what they're supposed to be doing is maximizing the achievement of welfare. But if it turns out what benefits the parties to an exchange end up imposing costs on others, or alternately, giving benefits to some who get their benefits as kind of a free rider, uh, to some degree at the expense of others, then we're not having a situation where the market could be said to be efficiently allocating uh, resources. Remember the standard of efficiency is the extent to which uh, individuals are uh, mutually benefiting one another, one another in terms of their respective preferences. You know, the, the ideal situation in the market, one conceives the market as being that system that allegedly maximizes welfare, understood in terms of rational choice theory, is that here we have a framework within which no one has their level of want satisfaction affected by anything other than the contract they've entered into. Nothing other than that should affect one's welfare. But externalities are going to be those situations where the welfare of individuals are affected who are not party to the transactions in question. You know, whereas in the ideally competitive market that's supposed to be, in a sense, the supreme utilization of, of all sided rational choice, um, all transactions should be both compensated and charged. Right? In every transaction, you give up something, but you receive something in turn. And in terms of that charging and compensation, everyone, in some respect, has an increase in their welfare. Well, something of a different sort occurs when you have externalities. What would be an example of an externality that could be regarded as impacting negatively upon the welfare of people who are not involved? Pollution. Yeah, pollution. How does that operate in that way? For example, a uh, factory has some toxic dump that they put in the environment that can have some people living there who are not involved in working in that factory or buying from that factory. Yeah. So obviously it has a negative impact upon the welfare of others. Uh, and yet it, it does so uh, in a way where, obviously, they have not chosen to take on that cost that they're suffering from. Now, as Levine points out, if one wants to deal with these externalities, one way of thinking about how to remedy them is to try to bring the costs and benefits into line with one another so that the costs that uh, people incur owing to the behavior of some economic agent is not a cost that the perpetrator will escape having to pay for. Instead, one can make them pay for the cost. And in doing so, put them in a situation where, using their own rational choice, they will, let's say, in the future, avoid the kind of behavior that imposes costs on others. 
So one does that, in a sense, by raising the expense they have to incur in order to engage in that kind of activity. So this, for example, would be a way in which fines can operate. Right? You fine uh, someone who engages in, a, in, in an activity, an economic activity of some sort, that has costs for those who are not party to that economic activity itself. And in that way, you increase the private costs of the perpetrator so that, in terms of their own exercise of rational choice, they will not engage in that activity, given the cost. Because what they're doing, they're trying to benefit themselves, right? If, that, if you create the situation where they can't benefit themselves, benefit their welfare, which, you know, if you're thinking simply in terms of the, let's say, the um, uh, parameters of an enterprise, in other words, will the enterprise be able to be profitable by engaging in this line of production if it has to pay fines for pollution? Well, it may have to then uh, economize in the sense of avoid having to pay the fines by having to incur uh, measures that may be less onerous than paying the fines, but would escape having to pay the fines. And of course, you can have a reverse situation. What would that be? Something would be used to, um, well, let's say, um, uh, yeah, I mean, you can have incentives to avoid um, polluting. For example, what would be a subsidy that would have that effect as opposed to a fine? A tax credit? Yeah, you could have a tax credit for, for putting in uh, you know, pollution control devices and things of that sort. Now, on the other hand, there is another kind of approach to dealing with externalities, uh, which does not simply use a way of altering the private cost of benefit by using fines or ultimately subsidies. And that would be basically government regulation in the sense of having administrative rules or laws which the players in the economy are required to submit to. So for example, one can ban simply certain kinds of uh, polluting behavior. Uh, one could ban unsafe working behavior. One could ban, uh, uh, you know, uh, one could attempt to limit working hours if it was considered to strike at the welfare of individuals in various ways. Right? So you have this other way of thinking about how to deal with what could be considered the market failure in the sense that market operations left to their own devices involve these impacts upon the welfare of individuals who are not involved in the specific economic transaction. And then we have various ways of doing it. One is government regulation, both rules, laws, strictly requiring behavior of a certain sort, fines, subsidies, and there's one other uh, option. That the framework we've spoken of, one in which we have a government that is going to be upholding personal property, uh, will also have a room for it. What is that? another way of dealing with these kind of issues. Well, you can make use of the judicial system as a private individual. And you can sue those who are impacting upon your welfare. Go to court. You know, even if you're not doing it intentionally, for example. Polluters are not intentionally trying to uh, undermine your health specifically, but you know, if you incur a damage, you can, you, know, you can sue them, just as you can for any kind of uh, tort or not, which is wrong. Yes, can you? It's curious how working conditions or working hours could be considered as an externality if it's uh, a contract that the worker uh, agrees to with the employer. Okay. How might one consider an externality? It would affect not just the individuals involved, because if, if you're saying, well, it wouldn't be an externality if we're just talking about its effect on the welfare of the worker, who, after all, has agreed 
has entered into a wage contract to work overtime or to you know, work as, in, in many places today. I'm not sure. Where is your iPhone assembled? The factory where people can work 16 hours a day. Uh, as you know, my relatives, your relatives probably were you know, 100 years ago. But, but how might one speak of how long hours is having an impact on welfare beyond that of the individual? That of the family? Yeah, the community? Family, yeah, family, for example. And you could ask yourself, you know, what about child labor? You know, does that have an impact in general about, upon society in many other respects? You, know, you can think of various ways in which all sorts of uh, economic arrangements do bear upon other dimensions of life. Even just the health uh, toll of certain economic employments uh, bear upon society in general. But you know you have to point to those kind of things um, if one wants to say that well, as an independent property owner, you're entitled to enter into any kind of contractual agreement you want, provided you know we're talking about something that's not completely undermining the status as an owner. Now the other side of the kind of market failures that this way of looking at the economy. Um, cannot escape is the, the reality that public goods represent. Because in a sense, from the point of view of this way of thinking about the workings of the market as something involving the play of rational choice and the optimal maxim maximization of satisfaction of personal preferences, public goods are goods that, in a sense, are related to the welfare of individuals, but they are not provided for by the workings of the market. And in that regard, they represent factors that uh, could be said to impact upon individuals in ways where their welfare is affected independently of the voluntary transactions they engage in. Now, one way of looking at uh, the question of public goods is to look upon them as factors that, in a certain respect, are factors that individuals would themselves personally estimate to be beneficial to them. But the market does not manage to provide them to them. And the question is, why would there be an underproduction of public goods? And there's something about the public good that makes it something that will not be produced by economic agents who are governed in their activities simply by calculations of rational choice and maximization of efficiency. And, and, and why is that? Well, in a sense, in the market, individuals are only going to furnish goods under the condition where those who pay for the cost of producing them are also going to reap the benefits of producing them. Well, it turns out that public goods are precisely those goods that have the character that their benefits cannot be restricted to those who produce them. Now, in order for the good, in a way, to be something that the producer will, in a sense, be able to produce them with the real rational expectation of receiving benefits for doing so, well, these are going to be goods that, in a way, are ownable by the producer or can be thought of as being exchangeable by the producer to others, transferable to others by the producer. That is being something that could be counted as a commodity that the producer could be said to really have exclusive ownership of. But 
there are all sorts of goods that simply don't have that character. They're not indivisible, or they're not divisible in a way that would allow them to be, in a sense, exclusively appropriated by those who are involved in their production. They're just not of such a character that they can be subject to a kind of private ownership. And the nature of these goods is that when they are produced, they enter the public realm. And they enter the public realm in the sense that, in a way, one cannot help others from taking advantage of them. One cannot restrict others from taking advantage of them. So that even though one might produce them for oneself or for some other party, the goods are of such a character is that their benefit cannot be restricted to those parties. They have this character of being, on the one hand, non-excludable. Once produced, you can't exclude others from benefiting from them. And there's another corollary factor. They have the character of being non-rival, meaning these goods are not of such a character that my use of the good is in any sense going to undercut your use of the good. So what are these kind of goods we're talking about? I mean, LeBlanc gives us quite familiar cases, right? Think of all of the technical improvements that just become generally available. One might, of course, tend to restrict things by patents, copyright, and so forth. But on the other hand, there can be certain advances of various sorts that just are in the public domain. One can't restrict them. Or there can be infrastructures that are commonly available and commonly used. And the very rationale for producing them is to allow for common use, such as transportation, roads, rail networks, and so forth and so on, right? Yes? What about toll booths? Seems like a way to kind of profit off of a public good. You could conceivably, if it were such, it would be possible to manage to do something like that on a private basis and make it a viable thing. Of course, as LeBlanc points out, there are many things that are used in common that benefit wide groups of people that are privately maintained. But on the other hand, we can speak of public education that will be of benefit for the entire society. In a way, if you understand the importance of that, it may not be something that can be undertaken economically on the scale required. Now, of course, you still can have private education, but it might not provide the benefit to all. You can have public parks, for example. They have a certain character, have a certain kind of universal benefit. Of course, you could have a private park at Disneyland or something of that sort, right, where you charge admission. But that's something separate. We're talking about something of a different character. You could have national disease control, for example, which is something beneficial to all and could be recognized as being beneficial to all. And yet it might not be economical for anyone to undertake to do what is required to provide for national disease control, either because they can't do it on the scale required or they can't do it in a way that would make it profitable without excluding people in a manner that would defeat the purpose and prevent the eradication of disease. Don't we pay for these things through taxes, though? No. So are we the producers of these things, in a way? Well, is taxation and the relationship between the individual and the taxing authority the same thing as the mutual exchange relationship in the market? 
Well, it seems because both parties are benefiting. Sense, what? It seems both parties are benefiting in a way. Well, when you say both parties, um, who, who are the parties? And how are we to identify them? Is the party an, an individual in the market that has something to sell? I mean, are we, in a sense, buying something and paying our taxes? Is it actually a commodity exchange or is it something of a different character? And then you have to ask yourself, well, what is different? I mean, first of all, what is different about the tax situation from any other sale and purchase? It's not very voluntary. No, it's not, it's not voluntary. It's actually required to pay taxes. Right? And if you don't, you're subject to prosecution. Well, could you stretch that and say, I mean, in a way, you are agreeing to be a citizen of that country, though. So, I mean, you know your taxation would come along with that. Well, you know, how do you, I mean, is it, again, a transaction of property? I mean, and this raises the whole question of whether you can, you can apply contract to political relationships. First of all, can you appeal to contract, as a social contract tradition does, to talk about the way in which public authority comes into being? And it's important to note, by the way, within, and we'll look at this later, in social contract theory, the social contract is not between citizens and the state. It's not, for example, like that relationship that Socrates speaks of in the Crito or Crito, you know, when he's trying to speak about, well, he's trying to argue about why he should not flee prison and should accept a judgment that, precisely in so far as it was made democratically, is not a wise decision and could be regarded as wrong uh, in view of the, the arguments that he makes. Nevertheless, he's willing to submit to it, not because it was made democratically, but because allegedly there's an agreement made between the citizen and the state in exchange for benefits. Well, I take that back. It's not just that. I mean, Socrates, you may remember, first speaks about uh, how the state has helped bring him up and so forth and so on. Therefore, he owes things to the state. But he doesn't stop there, which indicates that's not sufficient. It's rather that there was an agreement that he entered in with the state um, to either try to convince the state to change its ways or to accept its laws. Um, and that allegedly is an agreement made between the citizen and the state. But in social contract theory, there is no agreement between the citizen and the state. In fact, for example, Hobbes will argue quite emphatically public authority would be completely undermined if there were any contractual relationship between public authority and citizen. Why? Well, then you would have to make appeal to a further authority to adjudicate the contract between the public authority and the citizen. But if the public authority is ruled to be the authority, it can't be bound to any other party. So if we're thinking about the contract with America, as I've been invoked in years past and is being invoked again, you know, it's different from social contract theory. And one can also ask, you know, in general terms, whether contractual relations can generate political relations, or whether they can even be the basis in which the state relates to its citizenry. By the way, do any of you remember what Aristotle had to say about, in effect, contractual relations as an alleged basis for political <coughs> political political power. You may remember we, we looked at some sections where he was discussing um, these positions where some would want to argue that the state arises for nothing more than to protect the person and property of individuals. That is, in a sense, it's an alliance that they, in a sense, contract with one another to establish. But he argues that's not really what is specific to politics. Politics is not just an alliance. Politics is concerned with more than private interests. It's concerned with more, with more than simply upholding property. So we, we will be looking at these kind of things. But keep in mind here we're talking about uh, factors that are recognized as being external, well, as being matters that cannot be provided for by the perfectly competing operations of the market. And public goods have this character. So for example, you take uh, lighthouses as a, as a salient example. Right? It's a benefit to all the seafarers 
Yet if one ship were to pay to build a lighthouse or one shipping company to do so, they could not tell, in some respect, uh, not being able to benefit uh, in exchange for the benefits taken by any other ship that comes by in the same manner. And so even though all ships may benefit from it, no one may be willing to incur the cost of building a lighthouse, which after all may be the only means anyhow. So you can see that there is this then, this, this other situation where the market, understood as a framework where individuals are going to be operating in terms of rational choice for the sake of fulfilling their own interests, will not succeed in providing for the welfare of its individuals. And there are two further factors to think of. And again, these are similar factors that we saw come up with regard to the classical political economy account of Smith. And one has to do with the effects of oligopoly or monopoly. Now, first of all, what's the difference between oligopoly and monopoly? What is oligopoly? Yeah, when you have several enterprises controlling a particular sector of the market, as opposed to monopoly where you have basically one. So you can have several large corporations, for example, who basically are the only producers of certain items. And you know, they therefore can impede the workings of uh, competition so that they can maintain prices higher than they would otherwise be, both by simply charging as much as they can manage to charge without uh, losing buyers, and by restricting ultimately the, the supply. And to some degree, the very size they represent presents a barrier to entry by any other new parties. How does that operate? How does the very fact of concentration of economic power in a particular sector make it more difficult for new players to enter? What resources do they use? Who's that? They can play the markets. Yeah, I mean, they can play with the market. And in the short term, they can undercut any newcomer to make it impossible for them to get established. Of course, they can be making use of all sorts of technologies and infrastructure that require that vast outlays of capital, which are very hard for any newcomer to amass and to risk and the like. So you have this problem. Uh, it's perhaps greater when you have a monopoly. And in a certain sense, it's not clear that oligopolies and monopolies arise owing to non-market interventions. Do they rise just because government has given certain privileges, like to the East India Company and the like, or to AT&T at one time? Or does the market itself, through its very own operations, tend towards monopolization for various reasons that we've discussed, and I think the various points that Smith brings out to indicate the ways in which perfect competition has barriers to confront that are due to just the very way in which the market operates on its own. So here we have something where, in a sense, the market might be said to generate barriers to free competition, barriers to its own maximization of the welfare of its participants. And you can say this calls again for an intervention, a non-market intervention, to break the monopoly is the oligopoly in various ways. Right? You know, it's a task, it's there. And then there's another factor that has to be taken into account, which you know is, is also at hand in Smith, but in a way Smith makes it be something that very much counts in a, in a very specific manner, the very work of the economy. And that has to do with the difference in the given endowments with which individuals enter the market. In other words, the differences in the in their property that individuals bring to the market. You know, what impact does that have upon the exercise of rational choice? 
Because obviously, you can think about your preferences on the one hand, and think of them purely, you could say, in a disengaged psychological sense. There are all sorts of things you would like to have, all kinds of things that you desire. But on the other hand, you confront scarcity. But the scarcity has two sides to it. The scarcity, on the one hand, involves what is the given allocation of resources confronting you. The other side of scarcity is what? Well, to use Smith's term, the effectual demand that you dispose over. In other words, what is your purchasing power? The less purchasing power you have, the less opportunity you have to, in a sense, maximize your desired satisfaction. Now, it's important to think about that because there's a tendency to sometimes equate the workings of the market with, in effect, the operations of, let's say, a society governed by a utilitarian principle, where the utilitarian principle is thought of as being a matter of maximizing the happiness in general, or, to put it in strict utilitarian terms, to just maximize the aggregate of desired satisfaction. The utilitarian framework, we'll look at this later, in a sense can be said to arise directly from a repudiation of an ethics of the highest good. Just think about the situation you're in. If reason is incapable of specifying the highest good, if reason is incapable of specifying the highest good, what implication does that have on Aristotle's own terms for, in a sense, the relative value of ends? Is there any way to rank them rationally? There's no necessary way of ranking them. And if you can't rank the value of ends according to what they are, according to their content, what else can you not rank that is sort of the counterpart of ends in the individual? Well, remember, Aristotle will speak, for example, how individuals, given that reason can specify what ends we should pursue, and with the highest good we are able to now have a ranking of the respective value of different ends, you can, in that way, rank different desires. Some desires are better than others, right? Because you can differentiate the value of the ends they're directed at. If, moreover, you recognize that individuals can acquire dispositions, meaning different sets of desires, from a situation that, in a sense, occurs because they, in a sense, have repeatedly acted in a way in pursuit of certain ends, so the desire for those ends becomes internalized, becomes a disposition, becomes a character. Well, if you can no longer rationally distinguish between the value of ends, and thereby no longer rationally distinguish between the value of desires, what can you not rationally distinguish the value of regarding individuals? Character. It's impossible to claim that anyone has more merit than anyone else, based upon character. So on the one hand, if there is no highest good, we are free from having to subordinate our choice to the achievement of any particular ends. We're free in that regard. I say do as you please. Alternately, we are equal with respect to merit. No one can complain to aim to be better than anyone else. So in that regard, it might appear that all that one is left with is a quantitative way of ranking our action. Because if we can't differentiate between what's right or wrong in terms of what we aim at, it might appear that the only other way we have of ranking institutions, conduct, and so forth, is by how many ends or desires we satisfy, no matter what they are. Where no one's desires have any preference or any rank over anyone else's, they all count equally. They all count only quantitatively. And thereby, the only principle that might appear to be left is that what makes one action better than another is that it maximizes 
the satisfaction of desires, no matter whose or what they are. Now, there's a tendency about neoclassical economic economists to think of the market as being something that, in effect, fits the utilitarian scheme. If indeed one thinks of the market not being wanted by externalities, not being wanted by quality of public goods and the like, not being wanted with oligopoly, monopoly, and the problems of individuals coming to the market with different endowments, which are going to undercut, in a sense, what are their prospects for satisfying their welfare. Um, nevertheless, there might be a tendency to think that, well, the unleashing of the market and of the mutually beneficial operations of commodity exchange is tantamount to satisfying the utilitarian principle. What difference is there, however? By the way, first of all, in the marketplace, if we think of rational choice as operating, as a way of understanding it, as neoclassical theory does, are individuals operating in, in conscious conformity with the utilitarian principle? in a sense for their own benefit. Now, at best, you might say, well, they're acting in a, in a relationship where they at least are acting for the sake of their own benefit, subject to the condition that in doing so, they allow someone else to benefit therefrom. But that's still different from acting so as to maximize the desired satisfaction in its entirety. Right? Because this has no bearing upon everyone's welfare. And of course, there's no bearing upon the externalities that are involved. But there's also another other thing that one wants to think of. Namely, does the market, is that a field in which all preferences, all desires can be satisfied? Can all desire, all desires, all happiness, in other words, be satisfied through the buying and selling of commodities? Or are there any things that are priceless, so to speak? that somehow may have to do with your happiness, but are just not commodities. They don't take the form of commodities. Right? The moment you attempt to, to substitute the workings of the market for a general utilitarian framework, you, know, you have to confront the fact that not everything can fit the form legitimately of a commodity. And of course, you want to ask yourself, well, what are those things? What are the things that are, in a sense, not to be bought and sold? Now, of course, you can think about the kind of distinction that Aristotle draws when he's looking at different uh, definitions of happiness. And you know, there are some who want to speak about uh, sensual pleasure, but that's nothing more than white battles. We have those who speak about wealth. There are those who, on the other hand, speak about honor. And there are those who speak about virtue. Well, honor is something separate from what might be part of wealth. I mean, can honor really be sought if it's bought and sold? Can virtue be sought as virtue if it's bought and sold? Should votes be bought and sold? Should parental responsibilities be bought and sold? Spousal relations be bought and sold? Right? You know, where are we to draw the limits? What is it that is appropriate to be brought to market and what is not? And that has some significance for understanding what are what is the kind of welfare that is in play in the market. Now, I, I, now, by the way, you know we haven't really been talking about normative questions here, and and in terms of this way of dealing with the economy, there, there are two different ways of looking at what's going on. One could say, on one hand that when we're applying rational choice as a way of understanding what's happening in the marketplace, we're being descriptive. We're saying this is how commodity owners operate in the market. They operate in terms of exercising rational choice. And we can understand what is happening in that way. 
On the other hand, one might also look at it in a normative point of view. I want to say that this is how individuals ought to act, whether or not they do so. That this is, in some respect, an ideal. They ought to act in this way. Why? Because the kind of welfare that they are acting on these terms for the sake of is how welfare ought to be construed. So, you know, if you want to think about these issues, in due time we're going to step back and deal with an explicitly normative investigation. But for the time being, I want us to, to again, think about the ways in which the economy is being considered. And at this juncture, I want us to turn to Marxist economics. And when I say Marxist economics, I'm referring to an approach that is rooted in Marx. It may not reflect everything in Marx. We'll see when we look into capital itself to what degree Marxist economics is following through on everything or some of what is to be found in uh, the argument itself. But there is an approach. And, and I want us to turn to look at this uh, next time. We're sort of out of time. Any of you have questions about the neoclassical approach? <laughs> kind of limitations it recognizes on the terms of there should be more to uh, yeah. uh, the very nature of the you know, approach to fashion choice is that it's not one that you can't think of because it's the very nature of human action is decision making and that you can't Impose any other further structures. Yeah. Now, note by the way that one could say that, look, in a sense, all voluntary action could be said to involve rational choice. Because if one is acting on purpose, one has an end. And one is, one is, if one is acting on purpose, one is intending to achieve that end. And achieving that end, one has to think about what will be instrumental to achieving it. But on the other hand, you might step back a moment and ask yourself, well, OK, granted, all voluntary conduct could be said to involve choice in this way, and a choice concerned with the achieving of the ends that one happens to have. But then one might ask, well, is this either something that renders impossible any further considerations regarding what is to be done? besides considerations of efficiency, meaning all we can do is calculate what are the best means for achieving given ends. And that's all we can do. Not inquiring about what ends should be pursued or anything else. Or alternately, might one recognize, fine, this is an, an aspect in all conduct. But that means we recognize that it would, it would be operative also when we're dealing with conduct that is considered to be wrong as opposed to conduct that is considered right. To engage in wrong conduct, you're also engaged in rational choice. You have an end, you're deciding what it means to pursue, whether you're a murderer or a thief, and so forth. Similar calculations come into play. So it may be, one has to think about, fine, it's there. It may not be exhaustive or determinative of what distinguishes what is valid in conduct from what is invalid. And to some degree, you often find a kind of waffling. If you look at standard utilitarian arguments by Mill, by Benton, and the like, they often will try to make the move that, on the one hand, you reject the Darren's utility approach. Reason is incapable of identifying the highest good. And then they want to say, well, it's just a fact that everyone acts so as to be happy, so as to achieve what they want. And the fact that everyone does it, allegedly, signifies that, well, we put it all together, as Mill says, it means that, well, everyone is aiming together to maximize happiness, as if you can put them all together and that's the same thing as happening as a principle, directing your own conduct, that you should be aiming to maximize desire satisfaction in its greatest quantity. But can you make that a normative principle by simply observing that everyone aims to be happy? Aristotle said everyone aims to be happy. Right? If 
you're acting on purpose, you're, you're acting to achieve an end. And you get satisfaction by achieving an end. But that's true in a way whether you're doing what's right or wrong. The question is what, what more can be said about the uh, conduct in question. And we'll be confronting these issues as we go. But for next time, we'll, we'll direct ourselves to the issues that come up in terms of Marxist economics. And then we'll look at the general issues that Keynesian economics confront.